Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and you can think of me as your friendly guide to the English language. We talk about writing, history, rules, and other cool stuff. And today, we're going to have an especially fun conversation with Ellen Joven, famous for The Grammar Table, and now with a new book out called Rebel with a Clause. Welcome, Ellen. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm sitting in the grammar empire, I feel like. Oh, I wonder. <laughs> I know we both have our bookcases behind us, the uh, you know required uh, wordy person Zoom background. Um, so for people who don't know, which hopefully isn't too many people, but tell people a little bit about uh, the grammar table and then your book. And then, and then my book, is that yeah. what you said? Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, well, the grammar table is a almost four year old project that I began in um, 2018. It's uh, literally a folding table that I got for like $40 and I unfolded it and stuck a grammar table sign on it and then waited to see what would happen. And um, uh, people came up and asked me grammar questions right away. Not exclusively grammar necessarily, you know, it ends up being pretty wide ranging about language, but they come up and ask me questions or they file complaints. You know, some people are a little bit annoyed about certain things or we just shoot the breeze about language. Yeah. So okay, then, Andrew, before we get to the book, I have to ask you, this was my first thought when I very first heard about your what you were doing. What on earth possessed you to put a table out on the street to talk to people about grammar? <laughs> <laughs> I really wish that I could track exactly what happened in my brain. But, you know, I live in New York and there are people with tables for stuff. You, often it's things that you don't really want to talk about, you know, or they're selling knockoffs or whatever. But, I mean, there is a his, it's such a pedestrian city that, and by pedestrian, I don't mean dull. I mean, there are lots of pedestrians here. Um, and so there's often this kind of conversation and public space thing happening anyway. And uh, just, I think when I was getting really tired of being on a computer, it's too much computer. There were too many computer hours in my life. And I thought, oh, I need more people time. And so I just moved all the grammar nerdery that was taking place on my social media accounts um, and in Facebook groups I belong to. And I moved it to the street. How nice. So I guess you were a little bit ahead of the curve in, you know, getting away from social media and getting back into like interacting with, with people in the real world. Um, I don't know. Well, I, maybe, I think plenty of people have been doing this, have been trying to do this for a while. I am still on the computer an awful lot. The pandemic was not great for that. You know, <laughs> moving away from the computer during COVID was not super easy. Um, but I, I really do love, I really do love talking. Like right now, I'm very happy because I'm talking about grammar with you. As it um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I find that when I'm on, it's like, you know, when I was a kid and I would watch too much TV, you know, like Saturday mornings, the cartoons would be on, I'd watch hour after hour and I would get cranky. Of course, I wouldn't know, admit that I was cranky, but I would get cranky. And the same thing happens with computers. And, you know, even though I like, I love, I love posting things and tweeting things. I love writing generally. So social media is like one big writing project as far as I'm concerned. It's still, it's still a lot of, of non-human contact. And as you know, it changes things when you are actually speaking live. It's just different. Yeah. And I actually was going to say you are still very much on social media. You do these wonderful Twitter polls all the time that I see. Did the Twitter polls come before the grammar table or after? Well, they definitely came after because I didn't have the grammar table account till the grammar table existed. So that's also, I think that is also just from 2018. Um, and it took me a little while to realize, you know, these, the, the ability of different um, media to handle the exact things I wanted in a poll that varies. I used to do a lot of polling, um, and questions on Facebook, but it doesn't, um, the thing about Twitter polls is that you have anonymity in the responses. And so people don't necessarily want you to know how they voted. You know, they might feel embarrassed or self-conscious. And you also, the other thing is that on Twitter, you can't see how everyone else is voting before you vote. And I find it on Facebook, if I post an identical poll, it, it skews way off in one direction because people start seeing a trend and then that affects their answers. You got to like keep it blind. 
they, yeah, you have to not let let people know how other people are voting until they've made a decision. Oh, that's fascinating. So there's a pile on effect. Everyone wants yes, to go, go there's with a the grammar, crowd. <laughs> it's a grammar pile on completely. That's amazing. And so are you are you are you ever surprised by the responses to your Twitter polls? Like often or or never? Not often? I am I am about um one one percent of the time, I think. One to two percent, pretty rarely. Um, I mean, sometimes I'll be a little surprised by a gap but uh, it will still be in the direction I expected. But, you know, I post a lot. So one to 2%, it's a fairly regular uh, occurrence that I say, wow, that isn't what I expected. (laughs) Well, that's interesting too, because I would think of almost anyone, you would have your sort of finger on the pulse of uh, what people are thinking since you've actually been out talking to people. Often those those polls where I'm surprised are things that people message me about, you know, and say, hey, I have this question. So it will be something that I haven't necessarily thought about before. And it might be from a non-native speaker who has a different way of thinking about a language topic, or if it involves um, slang that's more common for a younger person, I, you know, I might not have heard it at all ever in my life. So I like, I like to think that the grammar table is an opportunity to keep me fresh, you know, not that I necessarily am going to go out and use it because who needs, who needs a middle-aged woman using teenage slang, but I just like to know what people are doing. (laughs) Hello, fellow kids. Um, so I, I love your book, the rebel with a clause. Um, did that, did you go into the grammar table project with the idea of writing it up as a book or did that come sort of midway or after you got started? It didn't cross my mind at all, which in retrospect, I think is kind of weird because I'd actually, I mean, I'd already written, I was in the middle when I started the grammar table, I was in the middle of writing a grammar book for business people. Um, and I had also, I had an agent who had been encouraging me to write a book about grammar since something like 2014, you know, like a general interest grammar book. And I hadn't really picked, you know, I hadn't really thought of an angle that interested me because I have plenty of grammar books that I like reading, you know, like people like you have written grammar (laughs) books already. So um, um, I didn't really have, I felt like I didn't have something really that, that fresh. And when I set up the grammar table, for some reason, the thing did not intersect in my head with my book writing interests at all. And it took people actually saying to me, this seems like it could be a book. You should write a book. And I thought, oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I really have no idea why it didn't occur to me. But it it was completely hedonistic. I just wanted to have fun and do something that I thought would have meaning that would touch me that would make me laugh and uh i mean i'm glad that the book grew out of it but but i really need to be more on the ball in the future <laughs> well and rubble with a clause the book it really is different from any book i remember seeing about grammar because you have so many stories it's it's really half grammar and or, or writing advice and half people's stories and um Gosh, I just loved that about it. And and it seemed like you had some favorite people you interacted with because they show up more than once in the book. <laughs> and and so the I I'm wondering there's the two construction workers that seem like you talked to them for quite a while. Do you want to um tell people a little bit about them? Sure. That was in Decatur, Alabama. And you know, by the way, the spots sometimes pick themselves. Like I didn't I didn't actually I think when we entered I'm not even sure when I entered Alabama that I knew we were going to Decatur yet. It's not that far from Huntsville. Um, so often we'd be heading, we being my husband, Brant Johnson and I, um, Brant filmed the whole thing, as you know, um, and is making a documentary about it. Um, so I believe around the time I crossed the state line, I knew that we were going to Decatur maybe. And uh, I'd never been there before. I didn't know anything about it, but it looked like a town that had streets. And that's, you know, that's the main, if you're going to put a grammar table on the street, that's the main thing you need is, uh, <laughs> you need is a street. Um, and uh, we set up in front of a, a barbecue place and it wasn't entirely clear to me how much traffic we would get. It wasn't like, it's not like Manhattan. You always have to try to pick places where there, there will be at least some people. And these two guys came along. It was, I think it was 
before noon. I think it was morning when we got there, late morning. And um, they were playing hooky from their construction <laughs> job. They were in their early 20s and they were absolutely hilarious. I think some I, I think it's possible some people might have been a little put off because they were drunk. It was, you know, 11 something and <laughs> they were a little they were a little off color at times. But one of the great adventures about this is just seeing how people are in different parts of the country. I mean, we are pretty similar. We all have, you know, similar types of limb functions and vocal cords and things <laughs> like that. And we eat and we sleep um, uh, and do a lot of the same things. But I couldn't have predicted the things that would have that were that came out of their mouth. <laughs> their mouths. They didn't have one mouth. They actually had each had their own mouth. But mm -hmm. the things that came out of their mouths and the things that they said to each other and to me um, were just amazing. One of them was a huge grammar and calligraphy nerd. And so he was, I think he was around 20, I forget, 23, 24. And he was annoyed with his father because his father in texts would abbreviate and put things like the letter K for okay. And it annoyed him because he wanted his father to write out full words. And he also hated when people didn't use commas. So he all, he showed me his texts on his phone. He was all excited. He opened up his phone. He showed me how in his texts he had full commas and he wanted to know if I liked his punctuation, which I did. I told him I liked his punctuation. Um, I believe I wasn't enthusiastic enough. So I had to reiterate, yes, I really love your punctuation. You know, he, he, I think he actually, I would have to look this up, but he definitely does the comma for direct address, you know, so if he addresses someone comma, then he goes on. But I think he even did, hey, comma, you comma instead of so like and then kept wow. going from there. So he's heavy on the heavy on the commas. And um, he really wanted to to discuss the apostrophe in y'all, which oh, is right. not my area of expertise because I don't say y'all. I don't think you say y'all either, do you? Or well, I, when I was a, a restaurant hostess, I used in college. I used y'all, even though I lived in Seattle, because it was a, a, it, it's the best way I think to address a group of people that mm -hmm. you know they come in and they want a table. And if I was saying, you know, would you like a table in, <laughs> on the patio? You know, I would, I would, my eyes would start darting around like, which you am I addressing? Right. And so, so I ended up using y'all, even though I lived in Seattle, because I found it so useful. But I haven't used it since <laughs> it's expired it expired after that that's yeah. funny um yeah so he was he was annoyed that so many people put y a apostrophe l l instead of y apostrophe a l l he was indignant mm -hmm. about it because it's you all <laughs> yeah and he um i mean it was perfect the discussion was profane enough that i i actually when i was in the copy editing process no pre-copy editing one of the editors wanted to remove some of the dialogue. So I had to clean up the book a little bit. <laughs> I remember that part, reading the the advance review copy. There's a sentence where it says, and then he said something my editor asked me to take out or something like that. And I thought, That's interesting. <laughs> I think it was a good editorial choice, actually. But I did want to honor it with a notation, you know, with a note that that something had been removed so people would <laughs> be able to use their imaginations. How funny. Well, that was one question I had is, were you writing the book as you were traveling or did you wait until the end after you were all finished and then start writing? Um, I wanted to be writing as I travel. I had all these grand ambitions for all the wonderful things I would get done while on the road. So I was planning to, you know, get transcripts from the videos, turn them into a book. By the time I was done traveling, I'd have the book done. I mean, it was really delusional. <laughs> I was, I was hanging on by a thread. I mean, it takes, it takes, the rhythm was roughly that, you know, let's say we were going to two cities that were six to eight hours apart. I mean, that's, that's like one day driving, one day with the grammar table, rest, and then leave the next day. And it's very busy, you know, and, and then I'd, I'd be reserving hotels from the car and, and stuff like that. So, and I, and I would get tired at night. It's, you know, it was all, a lot of what I did was in the summer. So it was hot and I'd be sweaty and dragging the table around. And, um, because, you know, Brant would often, I, I used to joke about this a lot because when we, I would book hotels that were reasonably close to where I thought I'd want to set up. So we would leave the hotel and Brant wanted to 
film me carrying the table. So I'd be dragging the books and carrying the table and he'd be on the other side of the street, you know, filming. <laughs> and, and I was like, I was like, Hey, there's something wrong with this picture. <laughs> a, a, a table. It sounds like something that would be heavy and books are heavy. <laughs> yes. But, but it's, it is actually really great. The footage that we have, because you can see me like, I feel like maybe I shouldn't be talking about this because this feels like maybe it's sort of behind this, you know, maybe it's meant to stay behind the, the movie scenes, but it's just funny. I find it funny, goofy. Like it makes me laugh to see me hauling um, stuff through the streets of New Orleans. It just looks silly. And that's why I, one of the reasons I like this so much because often people think of grammar as serious and for me, it is a hoot. Like there's so much, there's so many ways you can have fun. You know, the way people argue with each other, they get into these heated discussions. I mean, my dream for next Thanksgiving is that instead of fighting over politics, people will um, have a whole bunch of Thanksgiving arguments over punctuation or something. And then, you know, it will just be a lot calmer. Yeah, I try to do that on, around the holidays. I try to put out um, topics that people can talk about, like what, you know, ask your grandparent whether they called it a sofa or a couch. Uh, oh, that's up, good. Know, yeah. Some, some so people can talk about. Yeah, I don't have a lot of sofa couch expertise. What do you say? Um, I say couch. I grew up saying couch. I think sofa, oh, if I, I forget now, but I think maybe it's more of an East Coast thing. Um. You know what? I can't remember what I say now. I think I think I might be split. And I did spend about half my life on the West Coast and then the other half here. So I know I do love that New York is such a walkable city, like you were saying. Um, You know what? I just realized I did not spend half and half. I've been here way longer. I think apparently I think I'm a lot younger than I am. (laughs) Okay, well, just, I all. just had to fix that math. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so funny. So I know, so Brandt is filming this whole thing, or he was filming this whole thing. Um, so when is the documentary coming out? I'm not sure. He's pretty far along now. He worked on it all, you know, during uh, during the pandemic. I wrote the book and he, he worked on the documentary. So he has about a feature length body of work now that he's refining and I mean, there's a lot of stuff left to do, but it's taking shape. So when it happens, we'll know. Uh, Well, your love of language and especially English, but all languages really comes through and and how fun it can be and how you make it fun for everyone else who's reading your work or talking with you really comes through. So um, especially in your book, uh, Rebel with a Clause, which is out, you know, I, I think when this runs it'll be just out so people can go buy it rebel with a clause by ellen jovens